we will call this meeting, special council meeting to order. Please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. The council doesn't object to what for the reading of the mission statement this morning. Hearing none, the first and only item on the agenda is discussion only of a notice of intent, ordinance number 1191, and ordinance revising in its entirety, chapter 6, animal section 6 1, that's that uh, the town of Silver City Municipal Code. Councilor Thompson, would you like to talk to us about where we're at now with this? Um, yeah, I guess. Uh, Talk to um, the city attorney, um, and I uh, got the animal ordinance. Um, I, I think we need to clarify some issues. Um, I don't know if we want to respond. I guess the the main problems should talk about the stuff that's. Do you have any intent of? Making any major modifications on your own? Not major. Uh, I think the, uh, there's places for minor modifications for sure. Um, the stuff about the um, the definition of uh, service animal for sure. Um, but I, I don't see in the number the overall number of animals uh, we can discuss that I don't see that as being a major change though no, but I know there was some discussion of conflicts with state law and there's certainly uh, perhaps some um, there was uh, a point about uh, nonconformity with the uh, land use code um, the part of my ordinance, and if I understand what the complaint was, I, I could be wrong about that, um, was that there's a section that said that uh, the uh, ordinance has to be, has to conform with the land use code. Um, if, because I say that uh, it has to conform, uh, there would be some problems with um, the uh, revised animal ordinance. Um, to me, there may be, we, we have to remember that both the land use code um, and the ordinance should still conform whether I say it should conform or not. Um, both are living documents. So if we create a situation like chickens or if we say uh, it's okay to have chickens or if we say it is okay to have a, a goat um, and that is not possible in the line east coast then perhaps we need to change the line east coast um, and that's something that we I think need to discuss uh, as a group the problem that I see, the main uh, problem is that I, I don't, I, I can't uh, support an ordinance that is going to create problems in the future. Um, for example, we, we've seen this uh, in, in a couple of examples. Um, uh, the 18-inch uh, curbside parking, um, when that was written probably in the 1970s, uh, it made all sorts of sense, right? Uh, that the distance from the curb was a surrogate measurement for something that's fairly difficult to measure, which was how much the vehicle is going into the line of traffic. Unfortunately, as time and, and when it was written, the, the uh, range of width of cars is fairly uniform. So that surrogate measurement made a lot of sense. But as time went on, we started getting uh, a much wider range in cars. So you have a Prius and a Dually together. And so all of a sudden that measurement, that surrogate objective measurement stopped making sense. And because uh, we weren't able, because uh, we had that in the law, um, we created all sorts of frustrations. The same thing happened with the, uh, uh, the, the chicken 
stuff where a lot of people who really aren't a problem for the city were terribly frustrated by being um, targeted. So I, I can't have an, or, an animal ordinance that uh, faces that threat. Uh, as far as the state uh, conflict between uh, state statute and uh, local statute or local ordinance, um, I don't know that there was a lot of conflict. I think there was redundancy. One of, and, and really the only people that read ordinance um, are the officers. So, I mean, it's, to me, it, to me, having the flexibility. Uh, having the redundancy in something like this where we focus on uh, the, the uh, uh, cruelty and violence is something that is uh, redundant because it's so critical. And it gives people the opportunity perhaps to either go to uh, district or magistrate court or municipal court depending upon the severity of the problem. And this is a theme that goes through throughout the ordinance. Everything is, uh, there's a, a gradual response to every single problem. There is a, a, a clear delineation between those problems that are pathological that need to be prosecuted and those things that can be learned, can be changed. Is there anything else? I have one more. Okay. Could you actually articulate to us what is the problem or the list of problems that you're trying to solve? Yeah, I mean, one of them is uh, that we, one, one, the, the biggest problem, of course, is uh, we've got too many animals. Um, and the expression of that problem is the uh, uh, number of animals that are euthanized, the number of complaints, um, uh, a lot of the nuisance issues, um, if we do a simple supply and demand curve, when the reality right now is there's about 400 animals a year being euthanized. That's quite a bit more than a month. Wow, even worse. Um, when, when you have that supply level with the demand level that we have, um, that would indicate that the value of those animals is very low. So we should expect even more um, uh, neglect than we actually see. And you, when you neglect an animal, the expression of that is barking, um, it's aggression, it's all those things. Um, so, so that's the main problem. It's also a huge cost. Uh, it's costing the city um, quite a bit of money to deal with all these excess animals. The solution for that could be that we uh, hire more officers. But again, that would be something that non-animal uh, owners are having to subsidize animal owners for. A more elegant solution is to use a market mechanism for um, helping people to um, make better decisions. So what we're doing is we're targeting where people make the decision to get a dog or a cat. It's when they're puppies or kittens. That's when they're most uh, attractive. So we have a mechanism that allows us to um, track the puppies um, and reduce the number of intact animals. That's the main problem. The other main problem is what we've seen with what happened with the, uh, with the chickens. If we have ordinances that don't allow for certain behaviors and there is no realistic reason for um, having those uh, regulations, um, then what will come out of it is frustration. Um, unless the counselor or someone can explain to me why a single dairy goat or a weather is, uh, creates more of a harm than a dog, or the average dairy goat it creates more harm than the average dog, 
um, then I don't see how we can put that in the ordinance. It's, we're going to deal, we'll have to deal with the same problems that we had with, uh, that we had with the chicken. So those, those are the two main things. It's definitely a philosophy change in, in the whole concept of many of the aspects of how this was written. And I'm, I'm still puzzled and really curious. Do you have any idea on when the when that curve would change if this was implemented completely? There are <laughs> it's like Rumsfeld, my favorite uh, quote is that there's there's the known knowns, the known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns. And so one of the known unknowns is uh, um, that the biological population that we're dealing with is uh, Grant County. The kittens and the dogs um, that are coming into Silver City are not solely generated within the town limits. And so um, I, I have talked to the manager, um, uh, the county manager, and he's interested in, in looking at a similar ordinance. Um, if we assume that the county um, created a similar uh, market mechanism, um, my guess would be that the half-life of the animals that are creating the nuisance is less than five years. The thing to remember on this is probably, my, my guess is, is that about 5% um, of the total animals are contributing 85% of the, of the problems. So, and those animals tend to have um, lower lifespan than animals that are taken that are high value. So I, I imagine it would we, we'd see an effect fairly fast. Um, Councilor Thompson, you keep saying animals, but it's not the animals; it's the people that own the animals. So, well. We look at Silver City right now, and we don't know if the county would do this. Whether it's Silver City or whether it's the county, we have people moving into Silver City. We have people moving into the county. We have people that go to El Paso to purchase animals. We have people that go to Albuquerque to purchase animals. We have people to go to Tucson to purchase animals. Then people come back. It's people that own animals. So it's not the animals that are causing the problem. It's the people for all the animals that are causing the problem. So, um, well, I understand that the intent is to um, use a market me mechanism to um, um, essentially change behavior. Currently, while the number of dogs and cats is limited to two, we all know quite well that when people move in the town, they could have four. They could have, and they may be good owners, and no one knows. There are no complaints. They could have puppies. They could sell puppies, and no one knows because there's no complaints. Um, I think what I'm saying is, is that I'm not sure that the market mechanism is necessarily going to drive the behavior you seek. Well, that's why we have two parts to the ordinance. One is the, uh, the market mechanism where it's absolutely obvious to everyone that it's easier not to have an intact animal. Um, uh, it's going to be, they're, they're signaling uh, uh, throughout the process that says you're better off having an animal that is fixed. Um, the second part so that's one part, and you're absolutely right that, that that's not sufficient. That's why in the second part, um, we have so much emphasis on correcting behaviors incrementally. And so when uh, there uh, is a nuisance, 
instead of dictating the exact response, what we expect is that the police officers or the animal control officer would talk to the person and create a range of options that's available in order to make the situation better. Um, this allows the animal control officer also to target specific areas. And because this is uh, an emphasis on learning, it allows, uh, see right now what happens is, and we see it all the time, there's a barking dog, uh, someone complains, it's complaint driven, um, the animal control officer talks to the person and they end up immediately going into uh, magistrate court, getting upset and moving into the county. And so the root problem of the human behavior is in a dress. We never say these are the ways to relieve the burden of these animals. Um, they, it's entirely possible that uh, the, the barking uh, is something that bothers the owner as much as the neighbor. But that person has no idea how to fix the problem. When as, as part of a community policing um, program, what you do is you work with the owner to improve the, the problem incrementally. So we do with all sorts of other things in the town as well. You know, I mean, it, it, it is a different philosophy, but at the same time, I guess, um, trying to use an, uh, let me use an example. Great. So what I teach, I'll have a student, let's say that um, may have, I'll give, let's say they, they, they may not have understood that what they've done is plagiarism, and I'll give them an opportunity to redo the paper after explaining, give them a learning opportunity and ask them to turn it in. They have to turn it in or they're going to get enough. I mean, there's no right answer but. So they've been provided a learning opportunity. But and in this instance, they have, to, they have to do it or they get a flat out F or they can have an optional different grade, albeit lower, but a grade, you know, a grade lower than what they, you know, if it was an A paper, they get a B. Okay. In this instance, you, the, the animal control officer may provide them with several ways of maybe correcting their barking animals, um, but at the same time, I mean, what I'm talking about is you, you, the original question was this whole thing about reducing the population of animals that we have in Silver City. So nowhere in the ordinance does it say that you have to come back and show me that you have a license for an intact animal. No one ever has to prove they have a license. No one ever goes and, or a permit. Do you see what I mean for intact animals? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and you know, you, I mean, you can have an intact animal, but what I'm saying is if no one knows that you have an intact animal, so I guess what I'm saying is, is, so let's say I have four animals and I, that my dogs have a bark and nothing ever happens and um, I have puppies or I don't have puppies. I'm a very good dog owner. I, the other three dogs are 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 you know not intact and I have one and I care not to because someday I might want to breed, but you know maybe it's a male. And it's, a, it's a male dog so I would take the dog and it would be a stud somewhere else and I would get stud feeds for that pedigree dog somewhere else who's going to know that I have an intact animal there you go okay there you go mm -hmm. so if I have a Okay. But, but but I'm asking counselors. Let me ask the counselors. So I have an intact male that all you need is one male. 
right? No. <laughs> <Don't have to>. <laughs> 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 it's like you need one rooster and it'll do a whole lot of fertilization. And what I'm saying is, is one male can do a, a, you know, an awful lot of damage. Like one male cat that's, uh, that's not, that's intact, that's roaming around, that no one knows who's the owner, can go around and make a whole lot of little kitties. Yeah, cats are much more. Uh, so, so no one's going to know who owns the intact mm-hmm. male or who owns the intact females that are giving litters in other people's um, yards or, you know, out in, you know, the bushes. You know, what I'm saying is there is no way, I, I'm not sure how you can ensure that someone pays the permitting fee. And it, how this, how how this goes down? I mean, I mean, it makes sense, but then it doesn't make sense because these, unfortunately, are domestic animals, they're companion animals, and these are driven, it's driven by people, and people don't litter their animals. Uh, yeah, I think the the cats. So those are issues. The, the cats are much more difficult. So realistically, these are issues. There's an ideal and there's reality. And I think you have a great, wonderful ideal, but the reality is that I don't think we can, that it's necessarily going to work. Uh, well, let me explain how this part of it works, um, and then folks can decide whether it would work or not. Um, one of the... Um, uh, one of the requirements in the ordinance says that if you have puppies, you have to have the license number. It isn't necessarily, so when you're saying the complaint driven, I think what we are talking about is everyone's eyes are out there saying if you are selling puppies at Walmart, which no one's doing because uh, uh, enforcement's worked on that, but wherever puppies are, it doesn't matter if you're giving them away or selling them. If you have a little cardboard sign and it doesn't have the permit number on it, then the animal control officer is going to go give you a visit. Then we start tracking those animals. Any animal that comes into the shelter because of a problem, and you're absolutely right that if you have an intact animal and it's uh, not running, it's it hasn't been um, part of, it, it, it hasn't been captured, it hasn't created any sort of uh, barking problem, no nuisance at all, then it's, it's probably not a problem. But if we constrict the ability to get rid of animals, and then that is the point in which the educational process begins, because now we have access to the people who are getting puppies for the first time. So. The young families that, uh, I mean, this is the scenario that I envision happens quite often, where uh, a family who is uh, stressed for a lot of reasons, right, economic reasons or whatever, um, all of a sudden the kids come home, there's this incredibly adorable puppy. And the kids, uh, this this moment of... um, conciliation in the family and joy uh, associated with this puppy makes you uh, makes the, the uh, mother say yeah I'll, I'll take this dog unfortunately they don't realize at that moment because of a, a lot of uh, families that are in that situation don't consider consequences that extend beyond Uh, a week or a year or three years. A puppy is a 15-year commitment with huge costs. You don't realize that when you first get your puppy. So we've created an ordinance where we can target the humans through this initial mistake. We also expect that through the market mechanisms, we'll see fewer dogs being euthanized. When you start seeing fewer dogs euthanized, then all of a sudden we have options for the, the for enforcement. Right now, when enforcement goes to a to a household and sees a, a dog tied up, the neglect of that animal for the enforcement, for the owner of the for everyone associated with that animal, 
that neglect has to be up to that point where it is worth worse than death because a three-year-old animal that goes to the shelter is going to be euthanized. Well, what, like four or five? I mean, the, the problem is the probability of it being euthanized is much higher now than it would be if the population rate, growth rate, was lower. If there were fewer animals being euthanized, the opportunity for it being adopted is higher. That creates more options for everyone that's involved. So if you make a mistake and you say, yeah, this dog is beyond uh, my resources, um, and I have a very good likelihood that that dog's going to be adopted from the shelter, then I may be more likely to put it up. Once it goes through the shelter, then we know that it's not going to be intact. Well, thank you, Mayor. I just, I, it's still for me. Do you have another solution? I mean, that's no, the thing I'm is you guys asked me to do, to make a, uh, to fix something and, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'll be honest, I mean, I'll be honest, Counselor, for me, I think there's an ideal and then there's reality and, and I'm, I'm very pragmatic in, in terms of reality. I'm not sure that it, it falls. So how should we solve it? I don't, I don't have a solution at the present time, but I'm saying that, I mean, and this is something that I presented for everyone. We went to the shelter, and I said they, they were uh, uh, hesitant as well. Um, and I've always said the same thing with everyone that I've dealt with. Give me a better solution. I. But, but I understand you're saying give me a better solution, but in the present time, I don't think the solution that you provide so far is the best solution in regards to what we currently have. There, I mean, there's still something that may be better than what you're providing. And I understand that, but right now it's not its not making sense to me what you're proposing the way you've explained it. I think it's, it's a very nice ideal, and I'll leave it at that. We can continue to argue for quite a while probably on this, but I don't want to take up further time because I know that the mayor probably has additional I know I have other concerns with the ordinance as presented, but I think we ought to just get to the the easy one first. The nitty gritty, which okay. is the number. Okay, okay. And yeah, I'd love to talk about the number. You know, I I've made conflicting comments myself about the numbers and how do you come about a number? And it's not an easy question. But when I look at one neighborhood just north of me, one block, and you count the houses a lot, there you go. and I got that one block can have 80 dogs, mm -hmm. cats, whatever, and that's not to count the ones across the street from them. One, I don't think, I don't see any way possible that it meets a lot of the issues that you just spoke of in reducing the animals and and increasing the value of animals and I really don't see how it's going to decrease complaints and cause, I mean, you put 80 dogs in a block and there's going to be a fight or one heck of a rowdy party so I don't know if two is right but I'm really really confident 10 is not Okay, can I talk about that? Absolutely. Um, I really, like I said before, I don't really care what that number is. Um, there is a, 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 a logic to the reason for the 10. Um, the logic is that it addresses not the other nuisance problems. It addresses hoarding specifically and so where is that point in which we feel that there is a possibility for hoarding um, as far as the supply and demand curve whenever you're trying to move um, the curve to higher value 
what you're and you're reducing supply you don't reduce demand at the same time so theoretically it does make sense that you would allow as many animals as you want as long as they're not intact the likelihood and if we look at the motivation for why people have so many animals outside of hoarding often it's because of things like uh, their kids get dogs they go off to college they're not able to take care of those dogs and so they get the dogs back or uh, there's someone who has a dog that um, they see extra uh, a dog being neglected and they adopt it when the overall supply is reduced that's what's going to drive the number when you talk about 80 dogs possible within a neighborhood what's going to drive it is the overall number of dogs available so supply is going to drive it not you know I mean, if, if we went to that neighborhood and we talked to every single person we said if you had the uh, if we said it was okay for you to have 10 dogs would you have 10 dogs and no one would have them that's it, it, it's just not going to happen um, so I know people are, are uh, have difficulty with the ten, but I don't see that as being a realistic problem. When you create, when you address uh, the the other issues, the maximum, the average number of dogs per household is actually going to go down, regardless of what the law says. Well. The likelihood of all eight houses on that block having ten dogs, you're absolutely right. I can't imagine it happening. The worst option would be that one house on that block had ten dogs. Because the others either don't want dogs, don't want them intruding in their life, or don't want to do it. Well, how are they intruding? I mean, we've got that. Because you put ten dogs in a yard and they're going to intrude on somebody's life. And we're working. Barking. Okay, so we're going to hit the barking really hard uh, as a nuisance thing. See, the problem is, is if we say it's the ten, we're we're in the same problem as the. Uh, 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 and and I, I know the animal control officer really likes having the maximum number, like two or three, because that's a surrogate objective measurement for something that is otherwise difficult to perhaps measure. Um, our, the way we address that is to create a learning mechanism instead of using this surrogate. Um, the problem with the surrogate is that it is the, the idea is is that you have uh, this um, uh, subjective pattern and you have an objective uh, correlate that allows you to you're, you're measuring one thing for this other thing, right? So the problem is, is the maximum number of animals is a poor predictor of nuisance. There are much better correlates for nuisance. But, hold on. We have a maximum capacity exceeded maximum capacity of animals in the town now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think if you apply that exact same science to the overall system that you're speaking of, it, it's already failing. You know, and my solution might be leave it as a two, and if you want to have three or four or ten, go get a permit for them. And that way, if the problems that we're seeing now around the entire system that we're working on continue, we can identify. If you're not taking care of those three, four, six, seven animals, we've got you. We know how to get a hold of you. We know if your dogs are running around the neighborhood terrorizing, we know who they belong to because we on your permit. I really, and I really don't buy Councilor Bettison's argument that people move into town and they may have three or four animals, right? People move in from other towns that have whole different sets of laws and they come here. Right. People move into, yesterday I was researching the reciprocity on concealed carry. 
and there's a federal legislation going around that would allow reciprocity, mandate reciprocity across every jurisdiction in the country, which means the reciprocity, the, the mandate for the standards for carrying a concealed weapon then becomes the lowest denominator in the entire country. Well, we're looking at the same thing here. If you come in with three or four animals and you're a good animal owner, mm -hmm. then go out there, let the, let the town know that you've got the animals and that you're going to take care of them. And if there's a problem, we'll be on it. I, I just cannot grasp the tin. <laughs> well, and like you even commented, yeah, that it was horrifying. Terrifying. Terrifying. Yeah. Like H for T. <laughs> well, and I, I think you know, um, and I go back to you know the notion that with that tin, there was this uh, thing about no force of which can be unsterilized, and how that you know once again goes back to trying to reduce the, the population of animals. So, I mean, I agree with what the mayor just said. I like that. And I, what I would do is use that number, use it to and say, you guess what, that would be the multiple animal permit. You know, that's and that's, that's a lot easier to, to deal with. Um, because right now, the current ordinance um, says that you have to get a cow. Well, it's not a cow, it's just a multiple, you know, dog, cat, or, you know, animal. It's not really animal because it would be a multiple companion animal permit in that respect. So that makes sense. And that way people just go, because, yeah, people do move into town. Actually, a mayor, yesterday I understand that someone moved into the, was moving into the town of mayor and asked the, the clerk if they could have chickens. And the clerk said, no. You don't commit chickens in the town of Bear. So. Town in Florida is a lot of pit bulls. So one of the. Football player just moved in there with a pit bull. One of the things uh, that makes it easier to go with the two animals as opposed to what we had before is the emphasis on um, uh, changing behaviors. One thing that I don't like is. How, it, it, right now, the way uh, oftentimes the animal control operates is that if you are someone that has uh, three or four animals and the law says two without a permit, if he, um, he, he has the ability then to, to send it right to, to magistrate court and you end up spending $150 and people are angry Municipal, sorry, thank you. Um, municipal court, um, and so it creates these frustrations. So the second part of the ordinance, which allows the animal control officer to say, hey, you know, you've got more than uh, two animals or three animals or whatever it is, and you just all you need to do is go get this permit, it's not that much, and then we're able to track it, then, then that's fine. Um, one of the reasons for the, for the 10 being so high was um, that we didn't want uh, animal control officer using that variable to um, send people to, to court. I think Council Ronis um, specifically addressed that in the recent amendment to animal ordinance by including an administrative enforcement section that we just did because that was, we wanted to make sure that in the future that um, the animal control officer had the option um, to provide a, basically a, the option of the of the warning to do corrective action prior to going straight to the citation. We didn't want that to continue anymore. Yeah, and I think I'll have to look at, at the timing on this because um, yeah, I'll look and see. But uh, is, is that correct, Chief? It's now administrative enforcement um, in the new animal. And the amendments that uh, Council Ronis and I put forward that were passed and recently adopted, the animal patrol officer has the option for administrative enforcement, which permits the um, 
That's true. I mean, did he not have that option before? I mean, no, was he, it, was he, he had to. Well, you have to have it have it Um it's situational, it can be uh that there is enough information that the the animal control officer may cite that individual immediately. We've had occasions where the animal control officer has given warning. He's given directions of how to correct the issue up to and including options such as dog collars to prevent the barking, etc. on down the line. Generally what happens is the officer, animal control officer, will not cite until there's one or two or three violations that have occurred. Uh, there's been an occasion where we've also had to issue recent abatement ordinance uh, violation notices for the purpose of, of correcting some of these issues. Um, as a side note on this animal version issue, uh, I do want to bring up one point that, that is inconsistent with the, the noise ordinance which was put together. Uh, you have a 30 minute lag time uh, before an officer responds. Now that's contrary to the, the noise ordinance that we already have in place. So I, I would ask the city council to reconsider that section of that for the purpose of staying consistent so we don't have to provide a list to the uh, dispatch going out there while we have 30 minutes or you have 10 minutes depending on what the action is. So I would appreciate it uh, from the enforcement end that we stay consistent with other uh, ordinances on that. Getting back on the subject, the, there's always options. The officer always has discretion unless it's just one of those issues such as cruelty to animals, etc. that creates we have to do something new. I think, uh, yeah, we definitely have to make sure we can do things with those, uh, and then we're going to start. Just one question, please. I think it's okay to start, right? Okay. So, um, I thought that, uh, when that's kind of, we would have to have any information in this. Uh, in any comprehensive ordinance about barking since it's already covered in the noise ordinance. Are you talking about we have to have to do something else with the current the noise ordinance that was just passed uh, by the no. council room? So it would be redundant to have in here since it's already covered in the noise ordinance. So we need to have it in, in, in this ordinance. No, I so we basically have it removed from this because Correct. Not only do we have it in the, the ordinance that, that was recently put together, but we also have a nuisance ordinance that that covers on that. So it's, it's redundant, and if you want to get into some other redundant areas, I can cover those real quick. Um, or do you want to wait? Yeah, I just kind of want to thank you. Yeah. So I don't I don't really uh to me the redundancy isn't um that critical consistency is for sure. Yeah. Um I think uh having taken it out for the noise working is fine. But there is no benefit really of um, having to redundant teams in the moment. And my point with the, my, my point with having redundant teams um, relative to uh, cruelty issues between the state statute and local ordinance was merely that oftentimes um, we we not everyone is is looking between the two. But 
there's, there's not a lot of difference between state statute and um, uh, the local ordinance. Um, cruelty is fairly uniform. It doesn't really change that much. And my intention in, in creating that redundancy was to allow um, the enforcement to decide whether it gets kicked up to magistrate or if it's such a, a, a minor violation but still needs to be um, prosecuted that it would go to the uh, municipal court. And I, and I could be wrong on that, and I'm not really bothered if, if we end up just um, uh, referring to state statute, that's fine with me. It, it doesn't matter. I was thinking that for something, part of, part of how this thing is, was designed is to allow people to see that uh, violence or cruelty is something that is uh, treated completely different from things that you can learn from. That was the intent of, of putting the redundancy in. And we can remove it. I, I, would, I, would, I would really like to remove the redundancy because I think the redundancy is going to create a conflict at some point. Yeah. And then it could be three months from now when the legislature can. We would then have a brand new ordinance that conflicts with the box. And when we have a law that preempts our authority at the local level, it's, it's really a futile attempt for us to add it to our code when we have this preemption that we can't change, we can't manage. So, I, and if it's going to go to magistrate court, the magistrate has higher capacity for intercession. They have the additional resources that municipal doesn't have. And you know, these are some of these are really emotional issues. And some of them, whether they're acknowledging that they're abusive and neglectful of their animals, they may still consider it a balance. And I think the Supreme Court is much better prepared to handle that. And they should not be in municipal court. So, one of the other things the, uh, the uh, city attorney brought up too is that that's a, a court of record, and so with uh, cruelty issues, it's nice to have that record. So, no, I, I, I'm fine with that. Mayor, can I ask something as well? Because one of the things I noticed is that uh, throughout the document, the state law is separated out and scattered throughout the, this document, whereas it's intact the state law in some cases it's paraphrased and so it doesn't really follow state law completely or accurately and so that's the reason why I would want it to be removed and in one case um, on uh, page six um, it says dangerous animal also vicious animal and state law makes a distinction between vicious animal and dangerous animal because there is a state law in the books that says it is unlawful for any person to keep any animal known to be vicious and it's called a, a vicious animal law and it's a it's 77 dash 1 um, dash 10 so um, I think that we need to if we're going to use any words in here that refer back to anything that's a state statute that we actually refer back to state statute just to cover and, and for the points you made and also um, for our um, officers to ensure that they are um, covering um, state statutes as well as so Yes, and also for um, folks here in town that they know they can go to a state they can go to state statutes on the web. Um, we can also, if we don't have already, put that link on the website. I'm sure it is state statutes so that they can people can look up that under our ordinances. I mean, because we refer to them so often.
I mean, if it's not, if, if uh, we remove the, the language in the ordinance, there's no use of anything in the definition. And the state already has a definition. So animal fighting paraphernalia in the state law as well? Sure. You know off the top of your head. It's hard to know when I'm going to tell you. I can't go to fight on top. What about the, you know, the smart term of state statute? Yes. I don't know. And in Harper, the student younger talking to someone in the So I was going to go to the county path, and I said, I just was curious because if the state law is written as this was written, I'm in violation of it because the information about training or managing fighting animals, such as documentation and video games, is a separate item. Well, I have that on my computer because I was researching this ordinance. Okay. So, and that's part of my concern with that whole section was there's there's things in here that are individually considered versus a group of items that you can demonstrate somehow. I mean, if, if you're raising show dogs, you may have a treadmill. If you're running your dog, and, but in here it doesn't say a treadmill leathers that are being chewed up by the torturing animals and make them fight, plus fighting it, information, um, dog, what is it called, training or managing fighting animals, documents, you know, I, this definition itemizes them and make each individual one a violation. And I agree. Uh, that could create, create a problem. Um, you know, again, the city council may determine that they don't want to include that in there. However, if we get to some location and it has been fighting, then we determine that those items could be used to support a government for the purpose of our city. Well, I, I, if this needs to stay, if it's not covered under state, then I just think you have to change the wording to have these are the evidence that lead you to fighting for charges. Can I, can I say that I looked it up last night, and this essentially is the state statute here. Um, what's back here on um, page 52? This I couldn't find in state statute, so it must be the evidentiary materials, but I would think it would be collectively, because I can tell you that I have food and water additives for an elderly dog. So if he came into my house and that was it, you know, and then I, I have concerns with the presence of any animal that appears to be a fighting animal, um, you know, but not limit, you know, alone or together with animals suspected of being used as bait, well, I got, I have bait animals because they're little tiny, you know. Collectively, they don't make a dog. I mean, you know, anything, you know, they make a 25-pound dog. So I'm just saying that um, I, I would be concerned. I think somehow this has to be rephrased to say that collectively these materials would provide would be evidentiary in something, but that you can't use these individually as mayor, let's say. Um, right, right. So I would say if we want to retain it, it would be collectively in some respect, or at least it can't just be one single item in the flood. I don't own a dog, but I could still be in violation of it. Right, I know, right. The mayor should be picked up afterwards, but yeah. Um, and, 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 and uh, yeah, I think that in that respect, yes. So the next item that I have, that's the building, it's H54, the building is called the Southern Bosnia. Um, so the building is finally going to the special of the Indian State Council. However, I think we do want to um, take into consideration some verbiage where uh, any uh, dog 
the stage where the kid is uh, attacked. I mean, it, it punctured his, his leg. Um, everybody knew about this animal. The problem with the uh, current ordinance is that if you feel threatened by a dog, uh, the response is that dog has to be put down. And so because the response is so extreme, our response is that until the dog actually viciously attacks someone, we don't put him down. And so that's the, that was the, the, the logic behind the potentially dangerous. And the potentially dangerous, uh, if I'm walking along the street and a dog charges me, and it's on the other side of the fence, that's kind of potentially dangerous. And there is a, a mechanism that allows us to uh, change those behaviors. Um, to me, the state in that uh, example is being much more responsible than pretending there's no problem until a kid gets attacked and then saying, well, we didn't even know. That's the logic behind it, and um, I think uh, the idea of if, if if a dog creates a, a tear where you, you need closures, um, it's going to cost you a thousand dollars a year. Plus, uh, you're going to have to do all sorts of stuff to make sure that that dog um, doesn't encounter uh, people. Um, the likelihood of that happening is, is pretty remote. That dog's going to be put down. I appreciate that. by a lot of dogs on my bike. I, I don't like vicious animals. Um, uh, the thing, the, the reason that there is an, an avenue um, for people to keep a dangerous animal are those instances where perhaps, um, you know, he surprised a dog or whatever, where closures were needed. If you go to the emergency room now and you've got uh, a, a tear, then it, it, it gets the ball rolling for all sorts of stuff. It may not necessarily require always the dog to be destroyed. Um, and that's why we put in those extra options. I think that when you have a situation where a dog is, is bit somebody viciously, um, it's, it's going to get destroyed. And again, I don't have problems with that, uh, having a mandatory um, destruction of the animal. If I could, Mayor? Yeah. Um, I was just going to say that, I mean, in the case of been bit, you haven't entered the, the dog's yard. The dog has been running at large. Yeah. Okay. Well, no, I've had... Uh, uh, running at large and on, I've had instances where it's on a leash. It's on a leash, and yeah. so the owner has failed to control it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, well, let, let, me, let me finish. Too. Um, so, I guess what I'm saying is the the state statute talks about potentially dangerous animals and dangerous animals, so it covers both. And, um, I don't know, I, uh, I'm sorry, but my little Pomeranian somebody runs, if somebody walks by, she's got to run to the fence because she's protecting her yard. So apparently she's now a potentially dangerous animal. I can tell you that she doesn't like people to come in the yard because she's protecting me. She's very diligent about that. Um, whereas, you know, I used to have a big golden retriever who'd say, come on in, here's where all the stuff is take it, just pet me. Um, so, uh, you know, people are scared of the big dog. They're not scared of this little dog that runs up and could potentially bite you, but I don't like people to come to the yard and I always pick her up and 
holder so that that doesn't happen because I know that she's protecting me and I can't stop her from doing it. She's very protective. So I think, you know, when we're looking at something like this, I think to follow state statute, to follow um, what needs to be done is the appropriate thing. Um, I know there was recently something that happened in Albuquerque with a dangerous animal or potentially a dangerous animal that you have to follow all of the all of the steps in this process because um, by state statute, animals are property. They are not. I mean, they're personal. they personal property. Yeah. So they, there's certain things that have to be followed along the line. And so um, I, I think that um, I would not like the town to be placed in a position that if it be a potentially dangerous dog or a dangerous animal, that we be placed in a situation where we said, okay, you've paid your fee, so you can go ahead and keep it. Or you've paid your fee for your wild um, cat or exotic mini bear or whatever it may be and it gets out and something happens. So I have issues with the wild and exam and an exotic animal permit because they can be dangerous as well. Not always, but they can be. And I would not want the town to be placed in a position of liability if something happens and someone, a child or anyone else, um, you know, an adult or anyone, you know, is bitten or something happens. Um, so I, I agree, we don't want to be placed in that sort of a position where we're permitting something within the boundaries of the town that is um, not conducive to the health, safety, and welfare of the town's inhabitants, which is what we're charged with ensuring. Yes, and my apologies, but I'd like to make a motion for a brief recess. I there's a motion, and we'll, we'll have that in the topic. Yeah. You'll be the, we'll, we'll come back to the. We won't. There's a motion. Exotic, 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 and potentially dangerous. There's a motion, second for a brief recess. All those in favor, please vote. All right. We're in recess. We will call this special meeting of the town council back to order. And we only have about 30 more minutes to go today, which I think is actually not an issue. Is there's been so many changes in the number of things that it would probably be good to continue to send feedback to Mr. Thompson. And I think he's going to make some, some changes on the feedback on the phone. And it's been pretty significant. So it's going to be a Somewhere in a different document. Um, the other nine, we normally have a lot of time for the, the public to turn in and, and comment. On this one, I'm, well, I almost feel bad that everybody's spending all this time on this one. We're, we're really not to a point of having a document that we could have collected our time. That we're ready for consideration. So we're going to keep working for the next 30 minutes and make sure that we, we provide Council Council as much information as we can and uh, so come to a consensus at some point. Chief Steve. Mayor City Council, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Prior to the conclusion, we're talking about the potential dangerous animals. That, that's situational and, and is handled situational under the current ordinance. Uh, depending on the circumstance, dogs are always going to protect their property. But that doesn't necessarily mean that dog is a potential, potentially dangerous animal when it comes up to the parents, which is protecting his property. Um, so, in effect, that's a situational issue that, that the officer has to, discretion to deal with. As a side note, the worst bite I, I uh, had gotten being employed was from a chihuahua who came up and got me on the, the back of the, well, the utility tender. So, 
Yeah, I'm going to kick that dog in the house. But, uh, <clears throat> again, it's situational. It's just protecting this property because I didn't turn it on to the property. And uh, the rest of the information that I have in here is uh, pretty much in technical issue one side of the property. And I'm going to bring up just uh, the other side of the property. And I'm going to bring up just the other side of the property. And I'm going to bring up just the other side of the property. And I'm going to bring up just the other side of the property. In, in a portion of the ordinance, uh, under the scene to continue, uh, animal housing, storage, uh, currently going to the community, and, and uh, since, uh, trying to, you know, uh, you're only down dogs and, uh, cats. So, <clears throat> that may need to be adjusted. There might be other avenues that we, we have a, a cow, uh, there may be an issue with housing and such uh, other animals as exotic animals, uh, and that might need to be taken a look at. Uh, there may be, if this ordinance goes through, that may dictate that we have to now build an additional facility or look for other avenues uh, to the, to the city council. The last thing that uh, I want to discuss real quick is, is and, and just put forward, uh, based on the ordinance that the, the city council uh, is looking at and, and adjusting, uh, the potential for uh, additional expenditures is pretty good. Uh, I mean, that's obvious that that's going to happen. Yes, even a uh, portion of this goes through such as the application process, inspections, et cetera. Uh, in reading through the current document, I anticipate that I would have to hire two more animal control officers plus possibly a part-time secretarial uh, position to deal with this. The animal control, current animal control officer is making approximately 25000 I don't think that includes benefits a year or so. That's an additional cost. Uh, that the city would have to uh, pick up on top of additional equipment for expenditures. And, and the rest of it's more or less just technical. I'll, I'll push it forward so that the uh, city council also has the information. Can you explain why? Because I've got very many before. I just, just don't see it yet. Um, if we are able, I mean, part of the difficulty with this is we don't really know um, how effective the attendance is. Um, the theoretical, um, uh, theoretically, we should see uh, a fairly drastic reduction of um, nuisance animals uh, within a five year period. Um, when I look at the uh, amount of time that uh, the enforcement bodies are currently uh, engaged in nuisance behaviors. You know, the animals call for uh, barking and, uh, and, and uh, bites uh, and things like that. Um, I would have to say uh, my, my expectation is this is going to go way down and they'll be able to concentrate on other things that are more important. Um, so I'm, I'm a little... I'm, I'm a little confused as to why uh, this ordinance will create um, some more work. Mm -hmm. Depending on how many animals that you, you allow a person to have, that's going to create more work. This last year, if you take a look at this, you guys should be, uh, the city council should be receiving the stats um, probably by Friday or Monday. Uh, we had an increase in animal uh, complaints last year, I think it was 3%, uh, 4% uh, increase. With the ordinance, we're going to end up having, and we'll be behind the curve for a little while. We may be right that down the line five years from now it may decrease. But at the outset, getting used to it, education, uh, the complaint driven, because the number of animals, uh, and the likelihood of that's going to increase our calls for service. So, based on that, we also have, you know, uh, 
specific inspections that have to happen, specific permits that have to be uh, put in place. We also have to go out and periodically make sure that they are maintaining their current property or that permit uh, when they do bring you. Now, here's the caveat. We are talking um, theoretically. Okay, and here, the reality is how many actual complaints do we get uh, with barking dogs? How many actual complaints do we get about cats? Dogs, women, etc. Those are our three major complaints, especially in the evenings, etc. So you're going to see an increase if somebody has more dogs. You get one dog barking, they're all going to start barking. And I think and the, the whole purpose of this thing is to reduce the number of dogs. I mean, I, I really, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm amazed. The same thing we can, we can have it less, but I don't think that's what's driving um, the pattern. What's driving the pattern is the number of that that found. So we're addressing that really uh, aggressively. Um, if, I mean, you just look at your thing and you say, the, the difference between having an impact animal and having a fixed animal is so overwhelming that any reasonable person is going to say, I mean, and, and especially now with um, the, uh, the thrift store creating enough money that it's obvious that, that you're going to want to uh, fix your animal. You're going to have uh, most of that cost taken care of. And so, to me, that's, that's the drive. It's not the number, you know, this maximum number of 10 animals. I really don't think that if we reduce the overall number of animals available, the number of puppies available to our citizens, that that's going to drive nuisance more than the maximum number that we allow for them. I, I really don't think a lot of people are going to go out there and just end up. I can be wrong on that, but... And we can just add it to us. I don't care. But I, I don't see uh, that as being something that's going to require two more hours. And I do, because I'm the one that has to deal with the, the and if, uh, if I'm not trying to be disrespectful, I'm the one that has to deal with the, the number of calls, complaints, etc. that we deal with. Uh, our, currently, our patrol officers answer calls after hours of our animal control officer. So that's going to increase in the evenings and in the graveyard. So I'm not going to burden my police officers with the enforcement of this uh, without you now supplementing and ensuring that I get quality control of the first ordinance with an animal control officer. Yeah, our goals are identical. Right. I, both of us right. want to reduce the number of incidents caused. Um, I don't see this as creating more incidents caused. I tend to agree with you in the long run it may, may reduce the number of complaints, but again at the outset it, it's going to increase. And it's the, the, the variable that's going to increase it primarily is the tenor. So, okay. That's not a problem. Okay. Okay. I can believe we are going to increase animal control, probably regardless of the animal ordinance, because the complaints don't come from each of the four of the consent consistently. It's a 24 7 problem, and we've got a third of that covered. But I also think. The theory behind this ordinance is to increase education, increase the ability to provide a good, safe home for animals, to make them less intrusive around, to decrease the numbers. But to get there, whether we call them animal enforcement officers, their duty would increase in being educational. And as they go out there and they work to educate people and they show them, you know, this is not sufficient. You know, put the lean to on a couple of cinder blocks in the 
when you're more cumulative. And we see this all the time, where uh, uh, it's a dog barking or whatever, and uh, they, they go to court. Um, their response, because they don't truly know how to fix the problem, is uh, that you dissipate the behavior, you displace the behavior. We don't want to displace it. We want these behaviors to improve. We don't want to force folks out into the county because they have uh, they're, they're a little bit more limited. Because then the county has to do it. Um, and yeah, that, that can be a problem. But on the other hand, I think that uh, other costs, such as retention, your police officers are going to have such a better time seeing people improve and being part of that improvement. I think we've talked about this quite a bit. And uh, is that going to increase the overall cost of enforcement? That's a hard call because it gets pretty messy, doesn't it? So, I don't know. I, I wouldn't want... Uh, the other part is the, the, the educational part, which is the part that would require more uh, expenditures is fairly open-ended. Um, and so that allows us the flexibility to take time. Um, and if we see those incremental improvements, um, then I think uh, our expenditure should go down. I mean, that, that was the main uh, goal, one of the main problems of this, of, 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 that I tried to address with this ordinance is how do we reduce uh, the cost of enforcement uh, related to um, animals. I would much rather the police officers be out talking to people and doing all that stuff. It's much more dealing with, with animal issues. It's really hard for these guys. I, I imagine um, because they're the dogs are family. Um, they're compelling uh, arguments. Um, the the instance of the officer having to decide whether that animal should go to the shelter where she has a hot, a rather high likelihood of being euthanized, or staying and being neglected is a horrific place to be. And oftentimes, you know, I think we talked about this, that the mom of the family, the mother of the family who made the decision, when the officer leaves, she's the one who gets hit. Because the daddy, you know, the, the man of the house, doesn't like having an officer come in to visit. So, yeah, that's uh, my main concern was to actually lower um, the enforcement costs. So I, I've been surprised to hear that there, there's, this will cause an increase. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> main, uh, one of the things that, that, the, that the Mayor mentioned is he believes that we're, we need to look at potentially increasing our uh, animal control office anyway. And, and honestly, whether we were to uh, move on, on this new ordinance or stay with the old ordinance, I believe that's the case. I, I think we, we 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 need to start considering uh, increasing the budget for the animal control office either way. Um, we, we have some issues there. Um, one of the things I would like to to mention when as I look at this is, you know, I, I want to thank Councilor Thompson for for opening my eyes on. on many issues that there's a philosophy here that's, that's very important and, and, and profound and, and, and very interesting. Um, I'm not sure it has brought me um, to where I would support it over the current current ordinance. Um, might not even have put me on the fence for that, but definitely brought me to that fence looking at the other side. And I enjoy a lot of what I'm seeing. <laughs> but, but I don't know if I'm there ready to support it um, yet over what we currently have. But what it has done is it's, um, it's, uh, it's brought a lot of uh, attention to our personal animal ordinance. It's brought a lot of um, comments from the public. And as I look at the comments from the public, there's a handful of things that people say, that's right on the money, we need to do that. But many of those things, uh, I'll, 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 I'm going to illustrate a very specific example here, like the single point tethering. That is something that, that, that the community has said, yes, that is right, we need to do something like that. 
and that is more people say, yes, we support this ordinance, we want this ordinance, because of items specifically like that. But the handful of items, items that they're saying, I believe we could amend our current ordinance to fulfill that. And, and I want to and I want to suggest to Councilor Thompson to as he's looking to modify uh, this current ordinance um, to fulfill uh, uh, the needs and the comments here, also consider an amendment to the current ordinance and say, you know, if these are the items that have have percolated as the most important issues, maybe I could do that with more success. And, and I've mentioned this in, in, in other ordinances that I brought forward, but I want to see success. I, I do not want to see um, uh, ordinances brought forward uh, that, that have been worked on extremely hard again by, by counselors like, like Councilor Thompson. Bring it forward and put all these man hours and see it fail. I want to see something succeed. I want to see this, the, the fruit of this rainbow uh, uh, be successful and push forward. And, and I, I just want to suggest that, that, that you look at uh, potentially saying these are most these, these are things that I that that, um, that the community has found as specific issues that, that are a problem. And can I actually put these into the ordinance? Uh, uh, the, the current ordinance with more success and, and, and I think that's possible. That's possible. So even a even a, a complete change of the ordinance, it may have some, some potential as well with some rewording. But, uh, but but please look at look at that, and I think we might do something a little more powerful. Thank you. Thank you. As we run out of time here, I don't want to make the same mistake that we once before. The discussion that we have today is. Is. Because we have to do it in an open meeting, we can't all sit down and share those binding closed doors. So, that means that we can walk. so these are discussions. This document still belongs to Councilor Thompson. Um, he still has the ownership of it. He has the rights and ability to amend it as he sees fit. We are giving our individual ideas on how to create a document to, to help them. But as the agenda space is informational only and we're having a discussion, this is not a, none of the, there were no decisions that were really made in this meeting. So I, I kind of ended the meeting on this very same topic a few years ago an opinion that the last person speaking was the opinion of the entire body and I don't want to make that same mistake. So, uh, thank you. And I hope we can continue to work to improve the, the health of the community in Walter, our neighborhood and our success. So I'm going to take a motion. Mr. Mayor, I lose the motion. Mr. Mayor, I take that motion. There's a motion, second, good. All those in favor? 